We have covered quasars a number of times. Mainstream thinks that these are distant, massive black holes. In their view, these are some of the oldest objects that formed in the very early time of the universe. There are many problems with the observations of quasars that include that galaxies sit behind some of these which actually end up with a lower redshift, to ejected material travelling many times faster than the speed of light, and now a new quasar has been discovered adds yet another anomaly to that list. This quasar is hotter than any theory could explain. Let's dive into the detail of this one. A group of Russian astrophysicists observed the closest quasar to us using both ground-based and satellite radio telescopes. By using this combination, it allowed them to reach a resolution which was a thousand times greater than is possible with a Hubble telescope. They pointed this array at the distant quasar 3C273, which can be found in the constellation of Virgo. This quasar has been observed for a long time. In fact, it was the first to be identified as the core of a faraway galaxy some 50 years before this. From observations, we know that quasars are highly energetic objects that emit narrow beams of plasma. In the mainstream model, this is powered by a black hole, which draws material in towards it and creates a vast accretion disk around it. As the material falls in towards the black hole, these plasma jets are created from the poles. Eric Lerner looked at the research he and Bostick had conducted, looking into plasmoids, and realised that these massive objects were in fact not powered by a black hole, but instead contained a plasmoid at the heart. In Lerner's experiments, he was able to produce very small plasmoids, which formed by collapsing a plasma sheet. As the plasmoid formed, it compresses a huge amount of energy into a very small space, and caused protons to be emitted from one pole, and electrons to be emitted from the other. Astrophysicists want to try and understand the extreme conditions that exist around these quasars, and they speculate that these jets that were being emitted could not reach more than 5 billion degrees Kelvin. In their model, any temperature above this would cause a transfer of energy from the electrons to the photons and result in very rapid cooling. When they measured the temperature of the quasar, they discovered something extraordinary. The temperature they measured was in the range of 20 to 40 trillion degrees. They also pointed out that this quasar is by far not the brightest, and they indicated that our understanding of how quasar cores emit light is not correct. Let's examine some of the other strange aspects of this quasar. Early interpretation of the emission line emitting gas showed that it must have a temperature of the order of 17,000 Kelvin and an electron density around 10 to the power of 6 per cubic centimeter. These initial measurements indicated that heavy metal abundance was close to the value found in the galactic nebula, and hence similar to those found in young stars. This quickly presented a problem. If this object was to be at this remote distance, as suggested by its redshift, then it should have a very low metal content due to this distance and due to the age, as it has not had time for these metals to be produced in supernova explosions. It is now widely accepted that star formation is closely associated with a process of accretion of matter from the galaxies to the very central regions in which nuclear activity takes place. This, they therefore claim, explains why no nuclear activity involving only hydrogen and helium is ever observed. And this is a point that I think we need to come back to in future, but for now let's continue with this quasar. As they continued to observe this quasar, they realised that the brightness of the object was varying. The object appeared to be emitting energy across the whole electromagnetic spectrum. As observations improved, they were able to identify two different types of jets. One is a small-scale jet, which appears to be travelling at speeds much greater than the speed of light. And the other is a long jet, visible in radio, optical and x-ray. What is odd is that this jet is only on one side, no counterpart has been discovered so far. Continued observations also showed that this quasar resided inside a host galaxy, which itself was part of a poor cluster of galaxies. 
The galaxy itself is about three magnitudes fainter than the quasar invisible light, and this indicates that this galaxy is brighter than the most luminous galaxy of a rich cluster. So back to our temperature problem. At this stage, this temperature is a clear indication that something is wrong with our model. It is either to do with how the quasar itself produces the light, or possibly to do with where it is located. So how exactly do they measure the temperature of the quasar? Well, they employ a method called brightness temperature, and this is a way of measuring the temperature of a black body in thermal equilibrium with its surroundings in order to duplicate the observed intensity of a grey body object at a particular frequency. Now it is important to point out that this temperature is not a temperature as you would normally understand it. It is characterised by radiation rather than the movement of particles. In general, the brightness temperature is a function of the frequency and the intensity. So in that case, it is the amount of energy emitted per unit area in a specific time. Only in the case of black body radiation is it the same at all frequencies. By examining a variety of frequency bands, they are able to calculate the brightness temperature. And this is the crux of the problem, really, and this would indeed lead them to ever more ludicrous temperature values. In order to calculate the brightness, they need to calculate the area that is emitting it. And in order to do this, they need to measure its size in the image and work out its distance. The problem here is that the further away this is, the larger it becomes. And they calculate this distance using redshift, which puts it at an incredible distance from us. Now this is actually one of the closest quasars to us, but at the same time, it is also one of the brightest. They also need to adjust the frequency due to the redshift, which compounds the problem. So this would tend to exaggerate the temperature readings considerably. What if this quasar was not as distant, and part of the redshift was due to a plasma redshift due to the energetic electrons around the quasar? If this were true, then the object would be closer and therefore not as large, meaning the temperature reading would end up being lower. So is there any evidence that supports the idea that this is not a distant object? Halton Arp obviously spent a lot of time looking at quasars, and I have produced a separate video on this, and I would urge you to look at this if you have not seen it already. For now, I'm simply going to examine the object itself. As we previously stated, this quasar sits inside a host galaxy. What can this galaxy tell us about its location? We are actually able to measure the angular size of this galaxy, which comes out at about 30 arc seconds. So if we know how far away this galaxy is, how large does this galaxy come out given the 30 arc seconds? Well, using the values, this would come out at a whopping 355,000 light years across. And this is about three and a half times larger than our Milky Way. And our Milky Way is considered to be in that top 10 of the largest galaxies in the universe. Why would an older galaxy really be that much larger than the more developed ones closer to us? If we place this at only 0.7 giga light years compared to the 2.4 giga light years, that they currently attribute to it, then it comes out at a similar size to the Milky Way. But again, who is to say that this is actually that large anyway? If this is an early stage of a galaxy, why would it be that large in the first place? As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.